city on it man in Ohio on it man in Mississippi on it man in old Cheyenne wherever you might look tonight you might see this wanted man I might be in Colorado or Georgia by the sea working for some man who may not know at all who I might be if you ever see me coming and if you know who I am don't you breathe it to nobody cause you know I'm on the lamb on it man in Albuquerque on it man in Syracuse on it man in I'm offender, life sentence, with no parole. My business was kind of going under. The economy was bad. I had two small kids. I borrowed some money from a guy that was doing what he was doing and had to pay him. Well, time came to pay and I couldn't, I didn't have the money. So I basically, he said, well, you take this and get the money. That's where I started. Just trying to survive. Still in prison, 19 plus years later. It doesn't take five or 10 years for a person to be rehabilitated. And it surely doesn't take 20, 30, 40, 50 years because your life's gone. Your life's completely gone. May the 30th, 96. They miss out on a whole lot. Think about them every day. Matter of fact, I send him a card every year for his birthday, Father's Day, Christmas, Thanksgiving, and everything. And he do the same thing to me. Oh, yeah. He wasn't no criminal guy. Didn't smoke, didn't drink, didn't do nothing. Yeah. But that's the way life is. We got the foreign ports there. We got the American ports here. Rebuild them here, sandblast them here, wash them there. This is my daddy's shop. He had 88 people work there. And you see right there, it say Reed Sports Company. And I'm still doing Reed Sports Company. That's all we know. I don't know what to say. I'm just waiting on them to get home. The system backwards. It just backwards. I bet you we haven't talked about him, like, you know, no more than three times, you know, because, you know, it hurts. Yep. We don't talk about it. Oh, yeah. It takes a toll on you. When you sit down at the dinner table on Christmas and Bobby's not there. Thanksgiving, he's not there. Children graduate, he's not there. Father God, and you know that his mother has been doing those 19 years. Yes, Lord. Every day that he's done. Yes, yes, Lord. I'm angry. And I've been angry for a long time. That was this summer going into my senior year of high school. I graduated valedictorian. I went on to go to, go to college. I went away to school and I graduated cum laude. Then I got my master's degree. Five years ago, I got married. And a year and a half ago, I had my first son. 
And for every one of those celebrations, there was an invitation list. And his name was always on the list. But I knew he would never be present. And what's so frustrating is that even though he wasn't there, a lot of my success I attribute to him because he coached me along the way. Lord, the mighty, thank you, Lord. Powerful name thank of you. Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Lord. God bless you. You know, good people can make bad decisions, but you shouldn't be punished for it for life. America incarcerates more people than any other country on Earth. We're home to less than 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's inmates. Today, there are 2.2 million people behind bars in America. Now that's a 700% increase since 1970. We lock up hundreds of thousands of people for nonviolent offenses. And as a result, our prison system is disastrously overcrowded. And we spend about $80 billion a year just to keep it that way. Meanwhile, it's minority communities that are getting hit hardest. So we're here in Washington to find out for ourselves just how broken the system is. Now, perhaps the best person to answer this question is former Attorney General Eric Holder. So he sat down to talk with this former judge and federal prosecutor, who from 2009 until last year oversaw the entire Justice Department of the United States. So we have a problem with over-incarceration in this country. You have whole communities, you know, that either are locked up or know someone that's locked up or have been affected by being locked up. Is the American criminal justice system today broken? Well, people in various communities, and especially communities of color, poor communities, see um, a criminal justice system that they perceive to be unfair, and in fact is in many ways um, unfair. <laughs> and they see individual instances of people they know being treated too harshly, serving you know, too much time in, in jail, being held in jail you know, because they can't make bail. And that builds up resentment over time. And then there is a flashpoint. Police, civilian interaction that results in a death where people think it is, you know, it was unfair. And that's the spark mm. that um, hits that powder keg of resentment. And then you have what we saw in, in Ferguson. You presided over that investigation of what happened in Ferguson. And what did you learn in that investigation? I think what we saw in Ferguson was a justice system that was out of control. Mm -hmm. um, a determination made that uh, the way to fund government was to arrest people, mm -hmm. involve them in the justice system, um, put quotas on cops, mm -hmm. make sure that they wrote enough tickets. And once you got people into the system, uh, treat them in an unfair way so that you built up the fines, built up the fines. Um, and people got that. They understood what was happening. When I went to Ferguson and talked to people out there, the sense of anger was palpable. No justice, no peace. It pisses people off. When an incident occurs, all this accumulated anger um, explodes. Unfortunately, like I suspect we're going to see in other parts of this country as other incidents occur. It's not just about here in Ferguson. It's about North St. Louis, South County, North County, Kansas, Oklahoma, Illinois, New York, everywhere. It's happening every day. In April of this year, the city of Baltimore erupted when 25-year-old Freddie Gray died from injuries sustained while being taken into custody by local police. <laughs> Right near here, you had the same thing happen in Baltimore. What's happening with policing in America? Well, I think we're at a, a crossroads. There is certainly um, a divide that exists between communities of color 
um, and law enforcement in this country. This is not just about Freddie. People tired of this shit. Treating us like animals, as they call us. Thugs, as they call us. This notion of implicit bias, you know? Mm -hmm. Seeing a young black man and just making an assumption about who he is, what he's about, how likely is he to be um, involved in criminal activity simply because of the way he looks. Now, it's not just the head of the Justice Department who's calling out bias in the system. Police officers themselves are beginning to speak up. Sergeant Michael Wood is a decorated 11-year veteran of the Baltimore Police Department. When I was a sergeant, we were routinely one of the best squads in the city. But why were we the best squad in the city? We were the best squad because we had the most arrests. And I am feeding those stats with nothing but almost exclusively those black males in the 16 to 24 year old range. And it's not necessarily because they're the ones committing the crimes. Those are the ones we're supposed to be focusing on by our entire mantra of what is effective criminal justice. We suffered the longest human rights crimes in the world. When we had the uprising, it's like a straw on the camel's back that makes people finally say enough is enough. Whites and blacks have been known to carry narcotics at the exact same rate. So if we went around rallying through pockets whenever we want in a white neighborhood, I'm sure we'd find a lot of things, but we don't do that. We only do that in these neighborhoods. In a middle to upper class white neighborhood, if I were to go around and I were to lock up the judge's 16-year-old child for possession of marijuana, you can rest assured that I'm going to get a phone call that something is wrong and they're going to have high-powered lawyers that are going to come after the department and make sure that this thing gets buried. But if I do that to somebody in a low-income neighborhood, especially if they're black, then they just get fed into the system where they get public defenders that don't have any time, they get plea bargained out, and they become a nice stat for the officer and for the prosecutor that was nice and easy. Now, over the past 12 months, cell phone videos and social media have fueled nationwide outrage about racially motivated policing. But black families in America have been living with this reality for years. I think about my son, 17 years old, sweetest kid in the world, um, middle of the night. Um, he's doing something maybe he shouldn't be doing, you know, but nothing awfully bad. There's an interaction with law enforcement. How's that going to turn out for him? And so, you know, we have the talk. You know, don't put yourself in a position where um, something tragic uh, might happen. This is a conversation I had with, uh, with my father. I thought my generation might be the last one to have that kind of conversation. But, uh, you know, I felt obligated to talk to my son probably, I guess, three years or so ago. And you know, he's tired of me talking to him about it now. But uh, I want to ingrain in him this notion of uh, how you conduct yourself. And that's not an unfounded fear, as nearly 75% of those who end up in federal prison for drug offenses are either black or Hispanic. But getting arrested is just the first step, because once they enter the system, they face huge prison sentences as mandated by Congress. These mandatory minimum sentences in the federal system resulted in disparities that were uh, economic-based, racially, based um, and led to the incarceration, the mass incarceration problem um, that we are dealing with uh, even now. So we asked federal judge John Gleason, a former prosecutor famous for taking down mobster John Gotti, how mandatory minimums have driven this massive growth in America's prison population. You see all of these, these people coming in and you, by law, yes. have to put them away for a long time. Yes. What happens because of that? Injustice happens because of that. You look at the federal drug trafficking defendants, 7% of them are either a manager or a kingpin. 93% are low-level folks. But the severity that Congress intended just for that top 7% is being spread across the entire docket. If you're the judge who's imposing that sentence, you feel pretty bad about it because your job is to do justice. One of the reasons why we wanted to talk to you was because uh, we want to get to know how all of this began, how we got to where we are today. So we're in, you know, June 19th of 1986. Crack was new. Here in New York, the murder rate was four times what it is now. 
but there's an event that happens. There's this very popular college basketball player, Lenny Bias. He gets drafted number two by the Celtics. They have a party on campus in College Park. He dies of an overdose. I can't tell you how important that event is because Congress responds by passing a law that a drug trafficking offense in federal court then is going to be mandatory minimum 10 years, maximum life. But Congress made a mistake. They triggered those mandatory minimums by drug quantity and drug type. 100 grams of powder cocaine were treated the same as one gram of crack. Mm -hmm. That seems to be a little bit not well thought out. Well, the Congress blew it. You know, let's face it, crack was an inner city, poor neighborhood drug. So there was a racially disparate impact of these crack prosecutions. We need to come to grips with the fact that we have an overly punitive and racially discriminatory system. How do we change? Change comes slowly. Now, change has come slowly because for more than 30 years, our system has been entirely focused on the so-called war on drugs. We're getting tough on drugs, and we mean business. Christ! For those who are pushing drugs, we say, beware. If you sell drugs, you will be caught. And when you're caught, you will be prosecuted. And once you're convicted, you will do time. To go back, this was all based on the war on drugs. Was the war on drugs successful? Politicians got involved in trying to decide criminal justice policy. Statutes were passed, policies were put in place um, that had little or nothing to do with um, crime reduction, but had a whole lot to do um, with politics. Last year, we passed a very tough crime bill. Longer sentences, three strikes and you're out, more prisons, more prevention, 100,000 more police. Go, 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 go. You know, we heard slogans about being tough on crime without any kind of study or anticipation about where these policies um, might lead us. And Attorney General Holder isn't the only one admitting that the war on drugs hasn't worked. Did I win the war on drugs? No. Uh, in fact, I don't even think I made a dent in the war on drugs. John Urquhart is the sheriff of King County, Washington where he's been arresting drug offenders for nearly 30 years. You can arrest people all you want. You can put people in jail all you want. You can confiscate all those drugs, but there's still going to be more. We've incarcerated a whole generation of people, mostly African-Americans, and we haven't solved the drug problem like we purported to do. Yes, we put a lot of people in prison, but most of the people that we put in prison, or at least a good number of them, were put there for nonviolent drug arrests. Now, these nonviolent drug offenders are now going to federal prison more often and for longer periods of time than ever before. And as our prison population has swelled to record levels, the same politicians who pushed for harsher penalties are now starting to realize that they went too far. We had a lot of people locked up who were minor actors for way too long. And that was overdone. We were wrong about that. I signed a bill that made the problem worse. And I want to admit it. I think there are fundamental things that are broken. We can fix it, but <laughs> we have to acknowledge, and this is the first step, that the system is broken. Our criminal justice system isn't as smart as it should be. It's not keeping us as safe as it should be. It is not as fair as it should be. You're the first African-American attorney general. He's the first African-American president. There's a personal empathy there that maybe there hadn't been before. I bet that's probably true, um, given the experiences that African Americans have had in this country. You know, we know people. You know, I'm sure he knows people. I know people who, um, <laughs> who, I, who I was raised with, you know, back in Queens, in New York City, who got involved in drugs, who, you know, committed some, some crime and whose lives are fundamentally different. I might have played Little League with them. Now I'm the Attorney General of the United States, and they're barely scraping by. And that's why I think the President's approach, you know, my brother's keeper, 
His whole focus on giving kids, young men of color, that second chance. It's something that he has been concerned about since he was, you know, in the state legislature in, uh, in Illinois. And certainly something that has been of concern to me throughout my, my public life. Mass incarceration makes our country worse off. And we need to do something about it. So on Thursday, I will be the first sitting president to visit a federal prison. Now, our previous presidents have actually tried to prosecute their way out of the drug problem. President Obama is trying something radically different. In July of this year, the president traveled to a federal prison in Oklahoma, and he invited Vice to join him. This is the first time in history a sitting president has visited a federal prison. Why? Why now? Why today? Why is it important? Over the last 20 years, we've seen uh, a shift in incarceration rates that is really unprecedented. You know, we've seen a doubling of the prison population. A large percentage of that is for nonviolent drug offenses. Federal drug offenders have increased 21 times uh, since the 80s. There's more federal incarcerations for drug offenses than there are for homicide, aggravated assault, kidnapping, robbery, weapons, immigration, arson, sex offenses, extortion, bribery, et cetera, combined. How did that happen? I think there was a lot of fear. Level war on drugs, the crack epidemic, it became, I think, a bipartisan cause to get tough right. on crime. We need more prisons, more jails, more courts, more prosecutors. Incarceration became an easy, simple uh, recipe uh, in the minds of a lot of folks. With election day approaching and polls showing that drug abuse is the public's number one concern, today's voting became a contest to determine who could be toughest on drug traffickers. Nobody ever lost an election because they were too tough on crime. Sure. And so nobody stepped back and asked, is it really appropriate for somebody who's engaged in a serious but nonviolent drug offense to get more time than a rapist. What's been interesting is that violent crime rates have consistently declined, and the costs of incarceration obviously have skyrocketed. The stats are staggering. One in 17 white men will go to prison in their lifetimes. One in three black men. Is the criminal justice system in America racist? I think the criminal justice system interacts with uh, broader patterns of society uh, in a way that results in injustice and unfairness. The system, every study has shown, is biased somewhere institutionally in such a way where uh, an African-American youth is more likely to be suspended from school than a white youth for engaging in the same disruptive behavior. More likely to be arrested, more likely to be charged, more likely to be prosecuted aggressively, more likely to get a stiffer sentence. Uh, the system tilts in a direction that uh, is unjust, and particularly when you think about nonviolent drug offenses. This is an area where the statistics are so skewed you have to question uh, whether we have become numb to the cost that it has on uh, these communities, uh, whether we think it's somehow normal for black youth or Latino youth to be going through the system in this way. It's not normal, and it has to be addressed from soup to nuts in order for us to, to get some better outcomes. You've done drugs. Yeah. And you, you know, you said, hey, look, I've made bad decisions right. when I was young. Pretty much everybody does. Right. Um, but you know, I was in a community where I had the ability to not have as harsh right. ramifications for one of my mistakes. Right. Is one of the reasons why you're here today because perhaps you're the first president to feel empathy 
for the people that are here. Well, I'd like to think other presidents feel the same way, uh, but I can tell you I feel it uh, acutely. You know, when I moved to Chicago and I started doing community organizing in, in low-income neighborhoods, one of the most powerful thoughts that I had was driving by street corners uh, with kids who, at that stage, I was in my early 20s, really weren't you know, that far off from, uh, from where I was. And knowing that the mistakes they made would land them potentially in prison in, in ways that just were, were not true for me growing up in Hawaii. The notion that you or I uh, couldn't have easily been drawn into that, that somehow we wouldn't have fallen prey to the temptations of the streets, I, I, that doesn't feel right to me. That doesn't feel true. The president didn't just want to talk about the problem, though. He wanted to speak directly to the people who were doing time as a result of it. So he asked to sit down with six inmates for an unprecedented, unfiltered conversation. How y'all doing? How are you doing, All right, sir? All right. What's going on? What's your name, man? How are you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. Nice to meet you. Good to see Timothy you, sir. Timothy Jordan. Timothy. It's a pleasure. Good to sir. see you. Tyrone Red. Tyrone, good to see you, man. Thank you, sir. Arnell Stewart. Arnell, so nice to see you. Jesus Chavez. Jesus, good to see you. David Shaw. David, very nice to meet you. Everybody have a seat. Well, gentlemen, thank you for taking the time to meet with me. I know this is the first time this has ever happened. Yes, sir. I know some folks have been talking to you about uh, the, the reason for my visit. One of my concerns has been how uh, we're dealing with nonviolent drug offenses. The levels of incarceration have gone way up. The length of sentences increased significantly. Whether the, the sentencing and the price that not only individuals are, are paying, but their, their families for the mistakes they make are, are, are proportional, and whether we need to uh, make some changes. Uh, and I'm also interested in figuring out, uh, as people get released, you know, whether they've got the tools they need to be able to you know, stay on the straight and narrow, or, or whether the temptation is to go back on the streets and then end up back here. So my hope was just to have folks share their stories. Uh, I'd be real relaxed about this thing and just have a conversation, pretend the cameras aren't here. And, uh, how about you? I'm 24. I got incarcerated at 20 on a 64-month sentence. I had a B on roll during high school. And once I stopped focusing on my education and things, when I started experimenting with drugs, hanging around with the wrong crowd, You were dealing uh, ecstasy? Yes, sir. I liked it because I was meeting a bunch of people, you know, popularity, money, women, having fun. But I mean, in the long run, you know, just the simple fact that you've been incarcerated, people are quick to judge. Right. You know, I've tried to reach out to people that I went to high school with, and as soon as I let them know, oh, well, I'm in prison for, for selling pills, you know, it's, they, they're, they're quick to cut you off. Right. My little brother tells me, when I got sentenced, he thought what I was doing was cool, which already shows that young people out there have the wrong mentality. Nothing that's going on that we're doing is, there's nothing cool about it, about being in here. They don't realize everything that we lose. Is your little brother listening to you? I mean, I'd like to say he is, but he's at that age where, you know, Hard we all think we know everything, you know? <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I was 10 years old when he first got arrested, and now I'm 17 years old, and he's still doing what he's doing. So, I mean, I mean he's not like a criminal. He just had a problem. He cared more about being around his friends rather than his family, and I mean, he's not a mean person. I mean, my brother tells me, prison, this isn't a place for you to be or this isn't a place for me to be. I mean, it's hard here. I mean, it's no joke. We moped up here, you know, hoping to have a better life for him. Make plans like just anybody else for their kids as far as going to college and preparing them. And I don't know, what can I say? When it came to me dealing with my son and him being on drugs, it was a totally different person. 
It was, it's like a battle you can't win. Everyone always thought that he was gonna go on and do good things and knowing that he's in there now, it, it hurts. It hurts the family really bad and you know, he's a big piece of the family that, that now that he's missing, it, it, it really left a gap in our family. The fact that we couldn't get close to him, because for so long we have been close to him, but through a phone and through glass. I haven't hugged my son for so many years. I hunger for that day. When you think about your sentences, um, I know this is something that Shane and I were talking about. How many of you pled out? Basically everybody. Yeah. Now the vast majority of federal drug cases result in plea bargain deals, which are a way to avoid the huge sentences that the system might impose if the defendant actually took his case to trial and lost. Now in a plea deal, the defendant says he's guilty in exchange for a reduced sentence, no matter how weak the case against him might be. Didn't they charge you for a crime that you were supposed to have committed while you were in prison? Yes. I kind of feel that I probably could have, you know, beat the charge, but due to my criminal background, you know, I was more scared of the time I was going to get. So, just, and you were telling me about the same thing, that you pled down for... for I pled down to uh, 15 years. I was... My lawyer told me I would get life if I take it to trial. And Judge Gleason explained to us how these mandatory minimum sentences have driven plea rates higher and higher. One way in which prosecutors use the powers that Congress gave them is to say to someone, the way you're going to get out from under an, an unjust mandatory sentence is you plead guilty. You know, the federal criminal trial is kind of disappearing. Before we had this regime, the guilty plea rate used to be 80%. We now have a federal guilty plea rate of over 97%. Fewer of 3% of the cases go to trial. Prosecutors are determining how much time they're going to get before it, it goes to, to trial. You're right. Sometimes they use their power to compel an outcome that's unjust. This can happen even if the defendant isn't actually caught dealing drugs. Through what's called a conspiracy charge, he can be convicted for merely agreeing to commit a crime with another person. David Shaw pled guilty to conspiracy to distribute crack. Now, he contends that he was charged on the basis of allegations from people he didn't even know, on a date when he says he was already incarcerated for a separate offense. I was indicted on a 280-gram conspiracy uh, to distribute it, controlled substance, crack cocaine. And they got three people that's willing to testify against you and saying that you done deal with them prior in the past of selling drugs. So there were federal inmates yes. who basically said that you had been with them in, in they, they said that I sold them a certain amount of drugs so, so many times on this day. What's weird about that, too, the time they said I was selling them drugs, I was incarcerated at that time that they said that I was selling them drugs. If you're incarcerated when you're supposed to be selling drugs, why would you plead out? And that doesn't seem to make any sense. I mean, the reason why I pleaded out, because, you know, it's hard to beat. You know, I done seen plenty of people that took it to trial mm. and end up with a whole lot of time. When you go to court, you know, when they bring these people back, they, they got people that you don't even know that's testified against you. That mm -hmm. if I had people in my case that I didn't, even, I have never had met before. I don't even know their name. However, under conspiracy laws, that's actually allowed because defendants can be found responsible for any earlier discussions about selling drugs. They call it ghost dope. Mm -hmm. You know, you you charge me with 280 grams, but you have you, you don't have a gram of dope. You don't have a phone in, a phone or anything on the phone talking about drugs. No wiretap, none of that. But you stick a big me off of he say she say. You were saying, well, it's three against one. I don't even know who these guys are. They're gonna they're gonna say that I did it because they get reduced sentences, mm -hmm. and then he gets thirty years. You were risking the possibility yeah, of thirty years. Risking the possibility, and I, you know, thirty years would be a long time. I think most of us would agree that we plead guilty is not really much of, of an option, especially when they're charging you with, you know, dope that you, you don't got, quote unquote, ghost dope. The conviction rate's already 90 some percent. You see people getting 10, 20 life sentences 
and yet you see sex offenders walking around with five-year sentences. Well, we've all agreed that the drugs are doing damage in our community and right. doing damage to our right. kids. Right. Right. It makes sense for society to try to protect kids from yeah. drugs. Oh, yeah. On the other hand, this is, I think your point about just it being proportional is important yeah. and, and keep in perspective. I mean, I was, I was facing 20 years. Five years when, when they offered what, 64 months, I mean, that, that's a lot better than risking getting 20 years. And for those who don't plead guilty, the consequences can be devastating. For example, Stanley Washington was charged with intent to distribute crack cocaine. He took his case to trial and he lost, and as a result, was sentenced to life without parole in Alabama State Prison. Oh, wow. Look at that. Ah, oh, man. And I had a little one-man car wash in the bottom of that garage right there. I would wash cars. That was my uh, work at the time. But actually, I, uh, I dippled and dabbled in drugs. One day I was just here and uh, I was up in the front. There was all kinds of activities going around in the back. And I hear the guy say, Stanley, Stanley, get down, get down. So uh, I turn around and there's police coming from around the other building with guns pointed at me. Of course, I had a pistol on me, which I tried to throw away. <laughs> I paid for it, but I did do it. But I never thought that he would put me away for the rest of my life. <laughs> They actually thought I was dead. <laughs> a few times, I thought I was dead. My case is no different than a death row person, because we're both going to die on state property. I have life without parole, they have the death sentence. There's no difference. So I came up with the idea to write these lawyers, and I wrote our letters out to all of these lawyers, and one went out to Brian Stevenson at the Equal Justice Initiative, and he just sent a message to me that I'm going to help you. Two years later, I was back in court, Brian Stevenson made me a free man. I missed a whole lot. Stanley Washington was somebody who was given a mandatory life without parole sentence. Even though he'd never committed a violent crime, he was absolutely somebody who had a lot to give, but he ended up in the drug trade. So we went to court, and that's when we were able to get Mr. Washington's sentence reduced uh, and then get him paroled. The prison population of the United States was flat most of the 20th century. The last 50 years was this era shaped by a commitment to mass incarceration and excessive punishment. Prison population goes from 300,000 to 2.3 million, and this has really redefined the kind of country we are, the kind of place uh, we inhabit. I think the greatest tragedy of uh, the era of mass incarceration has been its impact on people of color. Uh, the Bureau of Justice reported at the beginning of the century that it expects one in three uh, black male babies born in this country to end up in jail or prison at some point during their lifetimes. That's a pretty shocking number. The bottom line is that if you're poor, and particularly if you're a person of color, you're presumed guilty. There is a presumption of guilt that follows you into the courtroom. Once you're arrested, that's what people think. And it then increases your burden uh, to prove your innocence, to prove that you shouldn't receive this kind of extreme sentence. It, it has created despair in communities of color. I sit down with 13 and 14 year old kids who often tell me that they don't expect to be free or alive by the time they're 21. Yeah, I did a lot of stupid stuff when I was young, uh, but uh, I've said this before, I was just in an environment where you could afford to make some mistakes. I had more of a margin of error than a lot of kids do, particularly if they're in a low-income community that's surrounded by uh, a lot of drug activity, criminal activity. Kids adapt to what they see. That's right. Um, the majority of my family members were, were dealing drugs, so I was kind of like, grew up around it. And as I got older, I decided that I want to be a, a part of that. Right. Tyrone Ramsey is serving 15 years on a nonviolent drug charge. But I appreciate the time that I am here because I'm taking advantage of it. I'm the, the college program, 
We graduated in May of 2016, so I'm taking advantage of this time to better myself as a man for my kids. When I get out, I can be a better person to them. They, they can look up to me like my dad has really changed his life, or turns his life around. That'll be a powerful message for them. Yes, sir. Yeah. Making this documentary, I spent a lot of time with offenders at different prison facilities around the country. And one thing that nearly every one of them said to me was just how painful it was to be absent from the lives of their families. There are over 1.1 million fathers behind bars in America. At a federal prison in Memphis, I talked with the inmates about this issue. If you look at the statistics, it's a lot of fatherless homes. So if you don't have a person teaching you the, the tools that you need to grow up to be a, a, a man, then quite naturally, we're going to be uh, taken by the gangs, the drug culture. I, I look at my life. My mother, God bless her, man, she was one of the uh, best mothers in the world, I, I believe, you know what I'm saying? She worked hard every day. She went to church every Sunday. But when I walked out my front door, because my father wasn't there, I seen the males, you know what I'm saying? Shooting dice, drinking alcohol, smoking weed, and that's what I gravitate to. Most definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have some type of father figure there to be able to teach the, those young boys, you know, before uh, they make those decisions to get in the game. So if you take a father figure out of a community, out of a family, that kid then has a greater chance of going to prison, yeah, and then there's the whole circle yeah. continues. Yeah. Uh, deteriorates. Uh, hey, I'll. Uh, I'm gonna speak on that. Um, this is really kind of a touchy subject for me. My father was in prison. Um, he had life in the feds. Also, I'm in prison. Then on top of that, I have sons. Two of my sons went to prison. So they followed the same footprints as I did with my father. Nobody was there for them. With that being said, uh, we need to be there for our family. We need to be there for our sons. But you got to start now. The change has got to start now. It's got to start right here in prison. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way we're going to be able to change our communities. Do you have a life sentence? Yes, I got a life sentence. But even though I'm in prison, my, my, my father and obligations don't stop. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Walls can't stop me from having to be a father for my kids. Even though I talk to him on the phone, write him letters, and, or I only visit a few minutes I get to see him, I still got to be a father to him. I got to help him because if I get it wrong, then where's, what's their future but where I'm at right now? I didn't know my dad. Uh, and uh, yeah, too many of our young people don't know their dads. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously, uh, for them to be able to see you uh, in, a, in a strong, positive way, uh, yeah, that's going to have an impact. I met my dad for one month when I was 10 years old. That was the only time I met him in my whole life. Even that little one month ended up having an impact on me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the kids are paying attention even when they act like they're not. That's right. I have a teenage boy that's, that's out there. I have a 15-year-old, 17-year-old, and I got a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old that's coming up. My main thing is they need to be busy. You know, because when I was growing up, I didn't have nothing to do at all. Where'd you, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Kansas City, Kansas. Mm -hmm. Okay, we on speaker. Uh, what's up, man? Hey. Man, I can't wait to get home, man. Uh, yes, the same thing here. Because, you know, like we always talk about, you know, the kids need their dad, especially yeah. the boys. They most definitely need you here. It's like my family's been torn for the last seven years. Yeah, it's just a matter of time. Yeah. You got to be strong. You got to be strong. Exactly. Well, maybe that's the last beep, so okay. the phone's gonna hang up, so I'll call you later. All so right. Yeah. We love you, too. Y'all yeah, be good. Yeah. It's very hard raising two sons. They need a father. I don't want them to be involved in street activities. I don't want them to be involved in any kind of gang activity. 15 years is a long time. The fact that he is in jail and I can't like see him anytime I want, it's sad. It breaks my little heart.
it shatters me and it shatters my brothers and it shatters my mom most definitely because she's doing this all on her own. If Tyrone was here, Tavante would be a better person because when Tyrone was here, I didn't fight with him at all. I think it hurt him the most because he had a really close relationship with his dad. When Tyrone went away, that, that broke him more than it broke me. It did. He has a heart deep, deep, deep inside. And I think Tyrone going to jail like covered all of that up. So he wants to be all hard and, you know, careless. So yeah, I do feel like he will go to jail for something really stupid, but I hope not. We can't raise kids in an environment where this is all they know and they're surrounded by it and then think that somehow they are going to be immune from the influences that they're seeing every day. Right. Mm -hmm. Part of the concern that I've had is, is that as a society, we seem to be okay with certain communities just being locked in this cycle where kids are being raised around drug crime. They naturally gravitate towards drug crime. They then get involved in the criminal justice system and it just turns and everybody thinks that's normal. It's what you were saying about your brother, just like, oh, well, the, you know, yeah. and my big bro, he's, he's going to prison. And then he starts thinking, I'll probably end up at some point going to prison and I'll be okay. Your dad was in prison. And he died in prison. Died in prison. So now your kids start looking, at, you're in prison and, and they start thinking that's normal. And, and we can't have our kids thinking that way. And now, part of it is everybody here has got to take responsibility to try to break that cycle. That's right. You know, for me, um, I got involved with, with selling drugs, using drugs, smoking marijuana at uh, 14. Um, and quite frankly, before drugs, I was a nerd. Book smart, straight A student, on a row. Arnell Stewart is a 27-year-old from Denver, Colorado. He's serving five and a half years for conspiracy to distribute crack. When you were growing up, was selling drugs prevalent or no, or how, how did it work? I, I grew up through school, the D.A.R.E. program, D.A.R.E. to say no to drugs. Um, my father, he would work sometimes two, maybe three jobs. And um, I also was, you know, disconnected from my mother for 12 years. My mother was using drugs prior to my birth. And so when I was reunited with her, the drugs were the commonality. And now you're in a, a drug program here. Absolutely. How do you think that program is working? Is it helping you or? It's taught me to recognize and accept the effect that my actions and my behaviors have on my community mm -hmm. and, and those around me. Mr. Stewart. Good morning, community. I'm Mr. Stewart. Good morning, Good morning Mr. Stewart. Before my incarceration, I struggled with grandiosity a lot. Due to my criminal lifestyle and some of the successes that I had educational-wise, I felt like I couldn't take advice from others because they weren't as successful as me. It hindered many of my positive relationships. I ran off individuals who, who wanted to help me, individuals who could benefit me, individuals who I need right now at this time. Recently here, I've been able to kind of reevaluate myself. Um, I've examined some of my thinking patterns and I wanted to be a part of something and it was nothing available. Mm -hmm. How much of that thinking relates to programs here in the prison? How much of it is just you, you know, being um, in your cell and kind of um, having to think through where well, you are? I think the core of it is the programming here at the institution. I found myself in prison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found myself in prison. Is, is there anything that uh, uh, you, you think about or worry about as you leave uh, and readjust? Because one of the things that yeah, you know, we're always concerned about is uh, the recidivism rate is, I'll be honest with you, it's pretty high. You know, 50% of folks who get released, they're back in a year later. Right. So part of what we're really spending some time doing is thinking about, you know, how do we make that transition effective? You guys are, have a good mindset now, but then you get back out, you go on a couple of job interviews, it gets discouraging. Your old friends call you back. Yo, what's up? <laughs> Why don't you come on over? Right? And it's, it's easy to fall back into the old patterns. How, how are you guys thinking about that? How are you processing that? Timothy Jordan is currently serving an 11-year sentence for a nonviolent drug crime. I've worked at Unicor for five and a half years, and uh, I, 
acquired real world job skills through Unipar. I participated in a millwright apprenticeship program there, which is an 8,000 hour on the job training. FCIL Reno allows inmates to work at Unicor, which is a job training program that teaches workplace skills, a benefit that, unfortunately, most inmates in the U.S. can't access. I didn't know how to do nothing until I got out here. Yeah. I got certified to weld out here. I got my whole certificate since I've been here. And you think you'll be a welder when you get out? That's most definitely. Yeah, because yeah. I learned a trade. When I first started here, I didn't even know how to weld. Right. But I've been in the shop for 85 months now. And when do you get out? At the end of next year, I'll be going home. And are you going to be I already have a welding job waiting on me out there when I get out. That's right. While you're here, you have to let the time serve you. Right. As well as pick up on what you can, learn what you can, trade and whatnot that they offer. And out there, you know, people are reluctant to hire an ex-felon. Right. Guys get frustrated by not being able to find a job. So what they do, they head back to the streets. Right. But even with some basic job training, re-entry into society can prove to be very difficult. Delmar Smith, for example, was released last year after more than two years in prison on a non-violent offense. Today, he lives in a halfway house that provides him with shelter, food, and the use of a car to look for a job. But finding one has been a struggle. Upon release, I was always nervous. I had never faced a situation like this. I'm walking into the unknown, being homeless, unemployed and the state only giving you $40 to walk out their gates away. $40 that, that they give you to leave with ain't enough money for nothing. The system is definitely designed for you to fail. Just keep on putting in applications. I try to get in at least five a day. How many calls have I got back? Uh, interviews have I got back? Zero. They don't want to give you a second chance. People just see you as an ex-offender. They don't look at you as a person. They look at your paper and say, OK, well, you've been to prison. You're no good. Unable to find work, it's no surprise that many former convicts turn back to crime. Pennsylvania Secretary of Corrections John Wetzel told us that the rate of recidivism, or ex-offenders returning to prison, is a crippling problem across the system. The national average of recidivism is 50%. So we're spending $80 billion and failing half the time, right? That doesn't make any sense. It's called corrections for a reason. We're invested in trying to get folks on the right path. And frankly, if we're being honest, I'm not sure that we've always achieved that goal. So we really need to be deliberate about the conditions under which we release people. We have to provide marketable job skills. We have to partner with employers to actually give people a shot. 50% of the people who walk in here don't even have a, a high school degree. If you don't have a, a high school diploma and you have a criminal record, I'm not sure what you're going to be successful at. Your prospects are hit the lottery or likely become reincarcerated. This is actually something that we're trying to spend some time thinking about is, first of all, trying to get employers to, uh, to not ask on job applications whether somebody's got a criminal record. Right. Look, they're going to take a criminal record into account. But if they have a chance to at least meet you, you're able to talk to them about your life, what you've done, then maybe they give you a chance. If they see it on an application, they may not even call you back. Right. right? And, and so what we know is, is that if the disclosure of a criminal record happens later in a job process, uh, job application process, you're more likely to be hired. Say, for instance, I want to open my own business. Will right. I be able to do that? Right. Will my background stop me from doing that? Right. You know, will I be able to open my barber shop? No. Right. So that, that's... You cutting hair? Yes, sir. Yeah? Yeah. I didn't do this. <laughs> no, it's, it's a pretty good line. It's pretty tight. <laughs> the, uh, there are federal programs where we're saying, for example, on small businesses, a lot of times the, the hardest thing about starting a small business is just getting the, the finance and the right. money initially. So right. if it's a barbershop, you know, how do you get you know, enough money to get the chairs in? And, right. 
you know, you gotta have a TV. TV. <laughs> you know. I kind of want to have a little. Uh... A little diner on the side. Uh, well, not see. <laughs> all right, we're going to focus on the barbershop first. We got the diner later now. The, uh, but uh, uh, what we're trying to do is to say, just because somebody is uh, an ex-offender, does not automatically uh, prevent them from getting finances. Right. Um, the good news is, is that politicians uh, start realizing that the sentencing issues uh, have to be dealt with in, in, a, in a smarter way. I can't guarantee that something's going to happen, but I, uh, I'm seeing more interest in reform mm -hmm. of the sentencing process than I've seen since I've been in public office. And, you know, that, and that's good news. Today in Washington, a Congress notorious for being polarized and dysfunctional is actually starting to come together to attack this problem, beginning with a bill called the Smarter Sentencing Act. Now, while it doesn't fully erase the disparity, between crack and powder cocaine, which is now 18 to 1, the bill would allow felons convicted under the old 100 to 1 policy to appeal their sentences in court. This is as diverse and bipartisan an array of members of Congress as you will see on any topic. And yet we are all unified in saying common sense reforms need to be enacted to our criminal justice system. I want people to get back to work. I want them to get back to voting. And all of these things, I think, are wrapped up in stuff that really both parties can believe, and at least some people from both parties do believe in. Excessive mandatory minimums do not make us safer. The last 30 years have shown us that they're applied unevenly and that they leave a gaping hole in the communities they impact most heavily. Now, one of the Senate's most active proponents for changing the system is Mike Lee, a conservative Republican from Utah. What's the consensus within the Republican Party about reforming the criminal justice system in America? I think everyone can acknowledge that cost savings are always good to find, but the far more important cost to consider is not the economic one, it's the human cost. Mm. The cost of having so many fathers and sons and uncles and nephews locked up behind bars for years, sometimes extraordinarily long prison sentences mm -hmm. uh, that don't seem to match the crime. New Jersey Senator Cory Booker is working across the aisle with Senator Lee to try and reform our sentencing laws. I joined the Senate at the time that Senator Rand Paul, Senator Leahy, Senator Durbin, Senator Mike Lee were doing a lot of things to try to change the system, and I'm happy to join. We have more African Americans in this country under criminal supervision right now than all of the slaves in 1850. Uh, these are urgencies that no matter what your party should weigh upon your consciousness. They belie the truth of who we are as Americans, and we need to address them. Now, Senator Booker brings a unique perspective to the fight. He's the former mayor of Newark, a city that has struggled with crime and incarceration for decades. This is where you used to live when you were mayor? Yeah. And why choose to live here? So we looked at the sectors in the city. This was one with the most shootings. So I wanted to move into an area where we could make a difference. And I knew that as a mayor, you're going to have 24-hour security, so why not have it in the community that really needs it? I feel so connected to this city because Newark is showing the best of what America can be, that grit, that strength that we respect about our country, but it also shows the darker parts of our nation that we don't want to talk about, sure. where we've gone way off the rails uh, that's unnecessary, hyper-expensive, mm -hmm. and violates our values. So you have Republicans, you have Democrats, you have the president, you have general consensus that reform is needed. What's holding it up? So, you know, I'm, I'm new in the Senate, and right. when I was mayor of the city, when we would see things like, you know, uh, we wanted to build this park right here that the kids are playing in. Right. And we built a park. Right. And the challenge with the, with the federal legislature is it moves a lot slower. We need a far more comprehensive focus, and we need to move with a sense of urgency. And we have to think about how many guys who are coming back from prison come back with no hope, believe that there's no opportunities. I think it was James Baldwin who said there's nothing more dangerous than a man that believes he has no hope. And we see this almost two thirds of the people coming out end up going right back down that slope. One business owner we met told us how hard it's been for him to stay clear of the legal system even after serving his time. So most of the fellas you know got involved in like really low-level stuff, right? And they get that criminal conviction, and then it's a trap, right? How hard is it to get out? What are you talking about? We're still trying to get out, man. I still got ties to the system. 
I'm still paying. For any crime you do, you're gonna pay a, a stipend. You know what I'm saying? And you, you come out of jail, you paid your debt, but you, but really, you haven't paid your debt because you got thousands of dollars exactly. worth of fines. Exactly. Sounds. What happens if you don't pay the fines now? We get relocked up. Now, these fees may vary, but almost every state requires offenders to pay for part of the legal process, like room and board or probation costs. Some states even make you pay for your public defender. Randell was living in Philadelphia when he was picked up for dealing drugs. And after serving his time, he couldn't find a job and felt badly behind on his fees. Stuff. Went back to Philadelphia, it was, it was like hard getting jobs and stuff you know, down there. So I just went back to what I was doing. <laughs> I was selling drugs, and I caught up. You go to see your parole officer and you don't have money, they will hold you. Job or no job. And if you don't pay, you come back to jail. Yeah. <laughs> I know one thing, I found myself selling drugs to pay back Pennsylvania. <laughs> Damn, yeah, that's, that's bad. Yeah. So my original max of three and a half to seven turned into like seven and a half to 15. <laughs> yeah, just keep you on parole forever. You'll never get off. <laughs> was asking about you <laughs> last yeah. weekend. Yes. I guess it's kind of hard for them to get a grasp of you being away. Yeah, unless you don't believe I'm in jail. No, because he believes that you're a work. Yeah. Many offenders can end up thousands of dollars in debt making it nearly impossible for those who can't find work to pay what the state says that they owe. And on top of all that, in many states, felons can't apply for food stamps, public housing, or education loans, effectively stripping them of the support that they need to rebuild their lives. And how long were you in prison? Seven. Seven. It took me four years to get a job. Four years? Four years. I mean, I had a little... I had one job making $5 an hour, then I got a raise to $5.25. <laughs> I sold soap, pencils, toothpaste, T-shirts, socks, whatever I could sell, right. so I wouldn't go back. And my kids would laugh at me. Daddy, man, you, 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 know, you used to take money, now you. So yeah. I showed them my check stuff. Yeah. They just was rolling the floor laughing. <laughs> Dad, you work for this? Come on, you can't take case. I said, just be patient, I'm gonna get you. I'm, 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 going, I'm coming, I'm gonna get you. I come back to Newark, New Jersey when I come back from the Senate, and, and I see the sense of urgency every single day. We have a perspective now with our country is that we're going to take a guy, send him to prison, and when, even when he's coming out, we're going to continue to crush you because we're going to make sure you keep paying for that by denying you job opportunities, by denying you business licenses, by not denying you food stamps if you're hungry, uh, by not denying you housing if you have no shelter. When you stop at an entrepreneur, who's still paying fines and fees, even right. though he's paid his debt. The urgency for me is seeing that we're dealing with the generational consequences of being the country that has the ignominious distinction on the planet Earth for uh, incarcerating its own people. We are the incarceration champions on the planet Earth right now. And we don't understand that that hurts not just neighborhoods like this, but it hurts all Americans. We're all paying for this. So many people are victims of this system, as well as their children. You've said, a lot of other people have said as well, the war on drugs has been a failure. The criminal justice system has problems. That's bipartisan now. Both sides of the aisle are saying, yes, we realize there's problems. This has become a big issue for you. Can it be fixed? So there's a whole bunch of front-end investments that we can make. If we focus on intervening with young people early, if we focus even in the schools and making sure that black boys and Latino boys aren't suspended at higher rates, if we're really investing in their education and their reading at uh, a third grade level when they're in third grade, then we know that they're less likely to get in the criminal justice system in the first place. If we invest in education programs in prisons, you heard those guys talking about how much of a difference it made for them. Substance abuse programs, and education programs. Vocational programs. Vocational programs so that we recognize you gotta prepare them for a better way when they get out of here because they're gonna get most of them are gonna get out of here eventually.
there is an opportunity right now, right now, to get this right. And anybody who doesn't sign up for it now is not serving the interests of the American people. If we can make progress on this subset of the problem, which is nonviolent drug offenses, we can actually get a working majority uh, around this issue. For our nation to be doing things that are contrary to our values, I think demands that all of us need to get up and do something about that. You know, King said it so much more eloquently than I could that what we're going to have to repent for in this day and age is not the violent actions and vitriolic words of the bad people, but the appalling silence and inaction of the good people. We can lose sight of how intoxicated we've become as a culture with imprisonment as a response to crime. We need to remind ourselves that there are real people and real families and real communities that have been altered dramatically. When you think about throwing everybody in jails and prisons, it's a pretty hopeless way to govern our society. It's completely inconsistent with a democracy that prides itself on freedom and equality. Lots of people are having their lives destroyed, not because they have to, but because we have chosen to ignore a basic commitment to fairness, justice, and equality. And that's the challenge of America for me in the 21st century. Nothing's easy. Most people aren't interacting with the criminal justice system and they don't see the impact that it's having on their communities. And part of our job is just to shine a spotlight. I think there's enough empathy among people of goodwill across the political spectrum that we may be able to pull this off.